It's a big one. We're joined by three NASCAR Hall of Famers, all of whom own cars that will be competing for the NASCAR Cup Series Championship on Sunday. Uh, welcome to welcome to Roger Penske, owner of the number two discount tire Ford and the number 22 Shell Pennzoil Ford. Rick Hendrick, owner of the number nine Napa Auto Parts Chevrolet. And Joe Gibbs, owner of the number 11 FedEx Toyota. We'll start off with a question for each. But before I do that, two housekeeping items. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll get that cue started now. Uh, and also, Rick Hendrick has offered up some extra time after we complete today's availability about the championship race to answer any questions about Jimmy Johnson and Chad Knauss' last race and careers. Please hold any questions about that topic until that time. Uh, this will be sort of a, like a, a media center panel, so please keep your, your microphones on mute uh, and, and direct the question to whichever gentleman uh, you'd like, um, and then uh, mute yourself again so that when they're speaking, uh, the spotlight is on the speaker. Um, we'll kick off with our question uh, and answer portion. We'll start off with you, Roger. Uh, Roger, with two cars in the championship, it must have been a unique week at the Ting Penske shop. How does having two cars in the championship change the operation at the shop, if at all? Well, I think, Mike, uh, you know, basically uh, having two people to sit down and be able to look at the data and how they're going to set up their cars because we're dealing with the same situation we have in the past, no practice, no qualifying. So we want it to be collaborative. I think it has been. You know, obviously, if you're playing golf and you're holding a seven iron, everybody holds it a little bit differently. But uh, overall, I think it's been uh, it's been a good week. Uh, you know, during the COVID, obviously, we've been working the team separately, coming in different hours during the last three or four months. Now, they've been really focusing here, obviously, uh, you know, for the championship. And Joey had the benefit, uh, his team, to be able to work on the car maybe, you know, a couple more weeks because of his, uh, his win. Thank you, Roger. Next, go to Rick Hendrick. Rick, all the momentum seems to be in the nine camp after the clutch win at Martinsville. How much of a role do you think momentum will play in Sunday's race? Well, I hope it plays a lot, a lot of momentum. Uh, they're riding high and feel good. Uh, we've got some uh, unbelievable competition here between Roger's two cars and Joe's car. So uh, we know we've got to be at our best, and uh, at least we've got a shot. So it's, it's good to be back in the ball game again. Thank you, Rick. And for Joe Gibbs, Joe, Denny is no stranger to this championship race. In your mind, what is it going to take for Denny to win his first championship? Well, we've been, I, I, would, I would say we've been struggling with that for <laughs> about 16 years here. <laughs> but uh, for FedEx, which has just um, been just a fantastic sponsor for us and Sure, appreciate them. We would love to have a championship. Uh, we know everything that goes into this and how big it is. Uh, but in particular, in our sport, which I'm sure, you know, Rick and Roger would testify to that the sponsors just play a huge role. They're really more than a sponsor. They're partners. And so I focus a lot on FedEx. Uh, we'd love to have it for them. Denny, um, obviously, he's had several opportunities um, and we've not been able to get it done. So it's a huge deal for us and um, a lot riding on it. And, but, but I think it is for uh, all three of us here as owners and certainly the four cars. I think this is gonna be, I don't know who to pick to tell you the truth. I think it's gonna be a real war. And uh, like uh, Rick said, we're just thrilled to be in it. Uh, but it'd be a huge deal for us if we could finally get Denny a championship. Okay, great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we'll now open it up to uh, questions from our media. Uh, again, um, for this portion, please keep the questions to Sunday's race or the season or anything like that. Again, Rick Hendrick will stick around uh, to answer any questions about Jimmy uh, and Chad and their careers uh, after, after the formal part of this. Um, so we'll open it up now and we'll kick it off with a question from Dustin Long. Go ahead, Dustin. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask this for Roger, but uh, Rick and, and, and Joe can jump in if they'd like to. Um, you know, Roger, Joe was just talking about the importance of sponsors. Uh, obviously, in this unusual year, uh, you know, a lot of places, the, the sponsors haven't been allowed to go to the tracks. I know that some will be allowed this weekend. Uh, you've been able, I think, to do some things to get some people in at the IndyCar races. And I'm curious, Roger, and, and again, the others can talk about this as well, what does it mean to have 
the availability to have those folks at the track and looking toward next year, how important does that become? And is it a case that maybe the sport should look at testing as opposed to waiting on a vaccine to allow more access for these individuals? Well, look, we're in unprecedented times, Dustin, and, and it's hard for me to forecast what's going to happen next year. So, you know, basically, as Joe said, our sponsors are key to us. Uh, you know, the revenue, the support, uh, what they give us from the notoriety from a team and from a driver perspective is unbelievable. And uh, when you think about Discount Tires hometown is Phoenix, it's a big, big thing for them this weekend. And certainly the Shell Pennzoil car, which is Joey's driven to a championship before. Uh, everybody's, uh, you know, really high right now. And I think that, uh, you know, having fans is important. We know that. And I think the industry, quite honestly, NASCAR's done a good job in keeping, keeping the epidemic, let's say, down in, in the garage area and with the industry. And I think that what we'll do is people that have access through suites and things like that this weekend, hopefully our sponsors will have that opportunity. But I'm not sure what the total access will be and the number of fans that will be in the stands. I just don't know that sitting here in Detroit. Thank you. I didn't know if Rick or Joe had a comment in, in looking toward next year, the, the value of, of having the sponsors more at the, at the availability of the races and if uh, testing would be something, a way to allow that more. I, I don't know about testing, but, uh, I, 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 you know, it, it's, I think NASCAR's done an excellent job again to finish the season. I, I was concerned and our sponsors were concerned that we wouldn't get the year in and, so hospitality is a big deal for our sponsors. Napa has a lot of hospitality. And so when they couldn't, when they couldn't have hospitality, we tried to do other things, but it's important to get our sponsors back at the track. But we do understand that at least we've got, we're able to race and finish the season, but uh, hopefully they'll get a vaccine and, and we can do some things that can uh, try to get some of those folks back. Uh, the, the, we love to see the fans also, but the sponsors, like uh, Joe and Roger said, without them, we can't do this. And, uh, and they've been really great to stick with us and try to uh, do the best that they can. And uh, we're real excited for Napa and, and for Chase, but uh, love to see uh, hospitality back in some fashion to get the key people back. I think the only thing I would add, Dustin, is to, you know, to fill in here with the other guys, is we're doing everything we can. We're doing Zoom hospitalities. <laughs> I just finished one with FedEx. And, you know, our sport, I just, I've been so thankful that our sport was able to get in the whole season. But echoing what Rick and Roger said, you know, uh, the experience that a fan can have at a, at a race is totally different than other sports in that they can come in, they have a chance to get an autograph from somebody, they see things up close, they could get on the starting grid, they can be in a hospitality and have uh, questions and answers and get pictures taken with the driver and, 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 uh, and us as owners. It's a huge deal for us. And I echo what the guy said, but we need to, we need to get back to where we can get our fans back to the racetrack and our sponsors. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we'll go to Nate Ryan. Go ahead, Nate. Thanks, Ford. Hey, um, a question for all three of you. Uh, you guys talked about how it's obviously been a challenging, difficult year. I'm sure some of you didn't think you might have gotten to this point. Um, what's been the most difficult thing uh, for all three of you, for each of your teams uh, in getting through the 2020 season? It can be anecdotal if there's a good example or story that kind of illustrates it. What, but what, what, what do you think has been the most difficult thing for your teams getting through 2020? Yeah, well, Matt, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead, Rick. I, I would say in our case, trying to schedule to get people in to work on the cars, but keep them separate and not uh, have a epidemic break out. I know in my other businesses, I've had uh, in some cases, 80% of the sales force come down with the COVID-19 and then you're just, you're, you're out of business. And 
we've been petrified what would happen if one of our drivers or uh, were become infected and have to miss a race. Jimmy had to, and it made a big difference in his uh, last year. So I think just trying to maneuver around no, no practice, uh, showing up with a car and uh, keeping everybody healthy. It's been an amazing uh, and, and, and tough year to make all that work. Yeah, Nate, I'd say the same thing. It's the social distancing and, you know, trying to, to meet those requirements both internally and externally have been, you know, really, really important. And I think the way we set our shops up, I'm sure Joe and Rick have done the same thing, different shifts, but the people really have gotten in line. You know, the only benefit I've seen out of the social distancing is that some of our people have a chance to be at home with their families. And we really, we want to see that happen during this time because it's important. That's another part of our sport is the family. And I think we've gotten a benefit there. Many of the people have not been on the road this year and that's given them the time to be home during this unprecedented time where they could be with their families. Yeah, I would say, Nate, for me, uh, I echo what, you know, Roger and Rick said, the no practice thing, I think really affected, um, you know, at least one of our teams in a big way. So that was a big adjustment for us. I think also keeping everybody safe and um, our front office, as I know I've talked to Rick, I'm not sure about Roger, but I would say we probably all are having our people work at home, our front office. And that's, you can get a lot done there, but what our guys really missed is that face-to-face -face and all the interaction that you get in the front office. That's been a huge adjustment for us. As a matter of fact, we started having guys come in, now our groups come in uh, twice a week because that's a big, uh, I think that's something that you really miss. So I think, um, but I think it's keeping everybody safe. That, that's been our biggest deal. We got a whole protocol on the floor. Our guys have to come in on the floor. We do it, um, you know, and try and do it in the safest way you can. But that's been the biggest worry, I think. And uh, follow up for you, Coach Joe. Uh, I, Denny was talking yesterday about how different it is this year uh, versus previous years where you, you have one car in the championship four as opposed to, you know, last year having three. Uh, and Denny talked about how that he sees that, you know, the, the dynamics being different in the shop there with the focus. So could you contrast this year to last year? And also, I know you're going to have uh, a new driver on the 20 and, you know, there's been speculation about the 18. Have you made any decisions yet in terms of crew chiefing lineup for next year as far as the 18 and the 20? Yeah, we've, we've uh, I'll take that one. We've, we've not made any decisions right now. Uh, we're going to review things after the season is over. Um, I think uh, as far as having one uh, car in, the chase, the, the good thing there, you can focus on that one car. <laughs> I, I don't know what problems Roger's having right now, but I'd rather have Roger's problems than mine. <laughs> but when, we have, when you have multiple cars in, then it, it, it gets to be complicated. What do you share? You know, there's a big question that comes up as soon as you, you now you have more than one car in the chase. Uh, the fact that we've had Denny in has actually been a little easier. I think everybody's focused to try and help him. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Lee Spencer. Go ahead, Lee. Um, Roger, this is the first time since NASCAR went to this playoff format in 2014 that you've had two drivers in. How much do you think that the crew chief shift um, kind of, you know, upstarted this uh, trend towards better performance among the teams? Well, Lee, I think, uh, you know, from the standpoint of the decision we made at the beginning of the year to make the crew shift changes, I think that's kind of like in your business, you know, people, sometimes it's time to move into a different environment. And I think it was really from the team perspective, the drivers and the crew chiefs, they all applauded that. And I think you, you've seen the outcome. And uh, to me, uh, you know, people probably wondered when we made that decision, but uh, I think they've all found homes together. Uh, we've had good performance and we're very, very fortunate to be in the position we're in today. And I take my hat off to the crew chiefs and drivers, how they've worked together so far this season. And I'm curious, since you know this sport so well from both the team and the track side and, and also the series side, what has been the biggest challenge for you in 2020? 
Well, the biggest challenge is always on the racetrack, competing against these two guys that are here with me today. That's, that's certainly, uh, you know, point number one, uh, the health and safety, uh, you know, of our people, you know, certainly would be number two. And then the ability to change the schedules, the work schedules, uh, you know, within the team. But uh, certainly we've learned how to, as Joe said, people working from home at a certain, certain times and uh, getting together. I think the Zoom calls, uh, the virtual relationships we set up with our sponsors has been brand new. In fact, I think it's been welcomed, uh, you know, by a lot of our sponsors. I'm sure that uh, Joe and Rick have had the same uh, good luck with it. Uh, you know, from, a, from a, a promoter perspective, you know, obviously it's tough because uh, you know, your revenue comes in through tickets and suites. And with that being not available, it really puts pressures on the promoter. But I think NASCAR has done a good job in getting us the full season schedule, which was not easy, tying in with our media partner and being able to complete that. Uh, and yet we come here to Phoenix, uh, you know, with, with four good cars vying for the championship. And I think Joe said or someone did earlier, you know, I'm not sure who is the best and who's going to win, to be honest with you. Obviously, we want our camp to be there, but uh, I think it's going to be exciting. Appreciate your time. Good luck, gentlemen. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Michael Knight. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, Roger. I'd like to uh, follow up on a, uh, J uh, Coach Joe's last comment about he'd like to be, he'd rather be in your position with multiple cars uh, going for the championship. For you've been uh, fortunate enough, the team has been to be in this kind of situation many times over the years. And it seems like your message for the teams has always been, we have to execute. And if one of us wins, the team wins. Uh, is that the same message that you'll have for uh, both crews and both drivers for this weekend? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we run as a team, we win as a team. And, uh, you know, we know when we go to the racetrack, if you have three cars, only one's going to win. So you've got to have that DNA throughout your whole organization. And it's tough, you know, these guys are competitive, but uh, I think the collaboration, quite honestly, and our crew chiefs, and we have the ability to share the information. We want them to do that. You know, obviously that's a byproduct of what we do at Indianapolis uh, in the IndyCar series, uh, you know, with our team sitting together after each practice. Now we can't do that this year because of the moratorium on getting together, but uh, it's a team effort. Uh, you know, to be in a position with two cars obviously is envious as far as I'm concerned, but you know, we still got to go out there this weekend and perform, but uh, it's certainly a team effort. And just to follow on that uh, for Roger, for if either of uh, Rick or Coach Joe wanted to comment, there's always a lot of focus on the telecasts about uh, pit road penalties, be they speeding or uh, loose lug nuts, all of this sort of thing. Um, is that perhaps your biggest worry, a self-inflicted wound going into Sunday's race? I think for me, Michael, you make a good point. What I love, you know, about racing, I love to see it take place on the racetrack. And if you lose a race, you want it to be because you got out raced by somebody. And what worries me the most is something that happens on a pit road or a loose lug nut or something we had our situation last year if you remember our three cars two of them had issues in the pits really and it cost us those two cars were out and so that's what worries you uh, for me anyway i love the fact that we can get to the last pit stop get it over with don't have anything uh, um, interfering with the race itself and either win it or lose it on the racetrack that that's that's what I would like to have happen this week. Yeah, we, we almost uh, were a good example of that. If the Jack man hadn't gone back and, and touched the wall, we wouldn't be in this deal. So, so it, it's uh, those kind of things, just you, you have to be mistake free uh, all through all the stops and, uh, and hit at the right time, all those things enter into it. And uh, so many times the best car doesn't win. And so just try to make a few mistakes, uh, no mistakes if you can. Self-inflicted wound, Roger, the worst? Well, I guess you can take a look at last weekend. You know, Brad, I think, was you know up uh, significantly up with points. And then he had the, 
speeding penalty coming out of the pits. And, you know, he was very fortunate to be able to drive through to get uh, one point to get in over Harvick. But, uh, you know, that's, that's absolutely uh, something we can't have. It's got to be zero defects. Six Sigma is not good enough for this weekend. Thank you all for your answers. Good luck on Sunday. Next, we will go to uh, Jennifer. Hi, gentlemen. I apologize for doing this, but I have a question for all three of you. Um, it's a different question for each of you. I'll start with Roger. You have two really confident drivers. Both of them, by nature, are um, certain in their abilities and both believe that they're going to win on Sunday. How does that play out between them? Well, look, uh, I'm glad they're confident uh, uh, or we wouldn't have them driving. I think all three to four drivers are confident going into the weekend. Uh, you know, quite honestly, we got two guys. The best guy's going to win. I hope that it's one of the two. And uh, we don't have any team orders from, from that perspective. Uh, they're going to race their hearts out and we're going to execute in pit lane. And uh, the best, uh, best driver is going to win out of the two. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Rick, um, Jeff Andrews said you were texting him to, at all hours of the night after Chase won on Sunday that you were really amped up for this. Um, how important was it to you to get back into the, the to the championship picture? Well, you know, it was 16 was the last time for us. So, you know, we have good – we have had some off years and uh, we've got some good momentum this year. I think our organization is stronger than it has been in the last two or three. So uh, it was so uh, such a nail biter because we had to basically win to get in. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, I was pretty amped up, excited for the organizations, excited for Chase as a young guy that uh, has had some opportunities to win this year that he, he got slipped away, but I knew how emotional he was after it was over. So, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just honored to be in there with these guys and, and see what we can do. Thank you. And Joe, um, in a few weeks, I guess Denny's also going to be a competitor of yours. Um, how will this relationship work? It, will it be any different than other partners or alliances you've had and do you have to set any boundaries with Denny? Yeah, hey Jenna, he better not be a competitor of mine. I'm paying the guy a lot of money here to drive this race car. <laughs> I think uh, I think what happened there really hopefully is great for our sport from a diversity standpoint and to get Michael coming into the sport. They're buddies really and they play golf together and so I think it's something that Denny um, will finish his career here. At least he says that, and that's what we want. And uh, then at that point, he's kind of made up his mind. He wants to go over and, you know, uh, it'll be something he wants to do in the future, become a car owner. I told him, <laughs> I told him, listen, I don't know why you're doing this. Okay. First of all, a driver, you're going to drive race cars, you get to have all the fun. Secondly, you make all the money. We, we got to pay hundreds of people to work on their race car. They pay three or four people. And third, they all got great looking girls. So I said, you got fun, money, and girls. I said, why in the world do you want to be a car owner? <laughs> I said, I'll, my biggest thrill is trying to make the payments at the end of each month. I think uh, Rick and, and Roger will testify that if I had a choice, honestly, and I'm telling you the truth, I'd rather be a driver. I'd love to have had the talent to be a driver. I wasn't, but anyway, we kid about that all the time. I, I think it's just going to be good for Denny. I think it'd be good for our sport, and and hopefully it's good for us, everybody all the way around. Our for, our sport should be for everybody. I think everybody feels that way, and so the diversity part of it, I think, is awesome. Do you I, I have, have to set to... any boundaries? Oh, sorry, Rick. Go ahead. No, I was going to say I have a bet with Joe. <laughs> I told Joe, I said, now, when that car doesn't run, that, you know, when Denny's car is not fast enough, he's going to come to you, Joe, and say, I want to give them this car that I raced and won with last week. And I said, what are you going to do then, Joe? <laughs> Rick, has a way, Rick has a way of getting to me. He did call me and tell me exactly that. 
<laughs> he said, hey, your problems are just, just starting. <laughs> Do, are you going to have to set boundaries with him to, to keep JGR and his team separate? No, I, I don't think so at all. Um, you know, I, I think he understands and um, we will be helping in some ways uh, with the new car over there. Uh, so I think, um, I, I don't think that'll be any issue, you know, for sure. Thank you. Thanks guys. Next we'll go to Jordan Bianchi. Go ahead, Jordan. Hi, this question is for all three of you guys. Um, Despite several significant weather delays this year, including the Daytona 500, television ratings are, are pretty good. It's only down 1%, especially compared to other sports, which have seen kind of a big drop. I'm wondering if you've heard from sponsors uh, about the television ratings and the encouragement, encouraging signs that you guys are seeing with that. I think the ratings, you know, obviously uh, the product on the racetrack has been phenomenal. Uh, the competitiveness of the teams and the cars and we're coming down here, you know, with just anybody could win this series. And I think the TV, both Fox and NBC have done, done a great job. And it's given us, obviously, the sponsors to, that support the advertising to have something that's not been way off like many of the stick and ball sports have been. So I take my hat off to uh, not only NASCAR, but our media partners. Yeah, I, I think I just, the only thing I would add, I was, <clears throat> I think we're really fortunate that our sport, you know, probably fits being able to get through this COVID better than other sports. You know, I was in football, you're in locker rooms, you're in meeting rooms, it's a contact sport. And so everything kind of goes against football and some of the other sports. We've been fortunate that we have one driver, he can go to the racetrack, no practice. Uh, we're outdoors uh, for all those reasons. Um, I, I and I, I gotta just tell you, I was thrilled with NASCAR and um, Jim and everybody there. What they did to get our sport through the whole year here, and it was everybody. Everybody chipped in the teams, everybody, and it was just. I thought it was. I thought I thought it was great because this could have been a huge issue for all of us. They're in the sport. I think our sponsors watch. Uh, they, lo they look at the ratings because all of the marketing departments that work for them uh, stay abreast of that. And we talk about it all the time. And I think the fact that we've been able to hang on while uh, most of the other guys are falling like rocks, uh, it, it's been good for us. And we figured out uh, ways with Zoom to to also keep their people engaged and coming, you know, constantly changing uh, what we're doing. But the racing has been great. So the fans are seeing some good racing. So I think, again, uh, just like these guys have said, uh, just to look, to go back and think we weren't going to get any races in to now here, run, we run them all and we're running for championship this weekend is pretty phenomenal for our for our sponsors. Okay, we have time for a couple more. Uh, next one, we'll go to Davey Siegel. Bad, Davey. Thank you, Mike. Uh, gentlemen, yesterday, Brad Keselowski estimated that the elimination of practice and qualifying has saved race teams about 20 to 30% of their annual budget. A, is that true? And B, would you guys like to see the one-day shows continue or – would you rather have practice and qualifying return in some way, shape, or form moving forward? Listen, I heard that comment uh, earlier, and I said he must be negotiating with me uh, um, before the uh, for the race weekend. <laughs> <laughs> they get passing along. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I I personally uh, I like the one day shows. Uh, in some cases, we'd, we'd like to have practice and qualifying. You know, I, I, uh, I think it's hurt guys like William uh, that he qualifies real well and, uh, you know, he needs to practice too. But uh, I, it's some kind of split there. If we can do it all, uh, it's hard to do. But our guys are on the road a lot and their families are enjoying them being at home some. So, 
uh, some kind of mix of, uh, if we go into a new track and we will, we'll have to practice and, and qualifying is a, it, it's a uh, fun to, to, to do and to watch, but at the same time, when we're trying to save expense, uh, extra time on the motors and tires and all that, it's, uh, I think the, the method they've used for starting the races worked out pretty good. I hope that what we can do in the future uh, is help the rookie portion of it, just like Rick just mentioned. You know, we've got Christopher and uh, for a first year guy to not have a chance to at least be in the car some and make some laps. So I hope going forward, and this is something that got thrown on us uh, in such a hurry, hopefully going forward, we can work out something where we can have a little bit of testing for the, for the rookies coming on board. So I think that would really help us. And it does sound like we're gonna have a mix of this going forward. Thank you, gentlemen. Next, we'll go to Greg Engel. Go ahead, Greg. Well, Davey kind of, because he's a better reporter than I, asked my question. So I'll follow up like this. Beyond the competition challenges of that more practice and qualifying, and, and yes, it's nice to have the teams home with their families and stuff. Has it been a significant cost savings for the, for the teams? I mean, that's something I know you guys, you have to balance um, a, a lot, and I'll have a follow-up. Well, there is, there's no question with people not on the road, we're not taking a spare car with us and things like that, obviously is key in our engine time or cost of engines, tires, et cetera. You add that up, it's, it's, it's very meaningful from the standpoint of overall costs. And yet we still have a product that I have to say has been is, as good as I've seen it in many years with, under the certain circumstances that NASCAR has today. I think Rick mentioned it as we, or Joe did, as we go into next year, some of these road races and places where we haven't run before, NASCAR is going to give us practice times and things like that, which will make a difference. So again, that's the tough thing, Joe, when we get a young rookie in, they try to work them up. It, it, it's, a, it's a tough ladder to climb without having a chance to get on the track. But uh, I think it's going to evolve. I think NASCAR will continue to look at it. We've got the new car coming and, you know, certainly in 22, but, uh, you know, we got to look at costs today. We're looking at that in our business. I know Rick does every day like I do. And uh, I think everybody's got to chime in and make it happen. And I think NASCAR has been ahead of it here, helping us do that during these unprecedented times. And, you know, even our sponsors, you know, they're looking at the cost too. And can they bring people to the races? And we want them to be able to do that in the future. So, this is the whole industry getting together from the sponsors, the drivers, the teams, and everyone else that's involved. So to me, I think uh, we've got a good plan and we got to execute it next year. Okay. Um, I'll have, I have just one, one quick follow-up, Mike, if it's okay. Sorry, guy, Greg. Um, was this something, this, this no practice, no qualifying thing, is this like a like a happy accident coming out of this pandemic, or was it something that that maybe NASCAR discussed with you prior to all this stuff that's happened over the season? Because um, I'm thinking it's a happy kind of accident that, that came out of the pandemic, and you guys see that it can work, and it's and it's saving you guys money. I don't think it's a happy accident. I think at the end of the day, we all got to get better, and and is is the cars are more competitive. And certainly, uh, you know, we always like to practice, but when you weigh the, the pluses and minuses, I think that uh, the industry itself and the chance for the owners to get together and talk about cost savings, we've been doing that now for a number of years. I think it's uh, just something, it's attributable to people looking at it and thinking, and uh, maybe this was the catalyst that kicked it off, but uh, there was lots of discussions about two days, three day shows. And then you've got infinity and you have trucks and maybe for the promoters, these other days can be really focused on those types of races, keeping the cup, you know, as a senior series for Sundays. Yeah, I think when you, uh, when you have to prep four cars, uh, eight cars instead of four cars going in on, on Sunday one day shows, uh, the, the chance of tearing a car up in practice. I mean, it's, it's a balance, but I think everybody, we were all, fearful of, of one day shows and uh, not having a backup car, but it's worked out. I don't, uh, some teams have fared better than others, but uh, I think our sport has adapted well 
and uh, it is saving us money. I think in pro sports, what happens is there's a lot of change this year because of COVID. It was a total, uh, it interrupted almost everything we were doing. I think in some cases, it showed us maybe a better way of doing some things. And we're all, you know, looking at it from a sports standpoint. I appreciate um, our management, France family, everybody running the show, getting all of our races in. But I think in some cases, you know, um, it was a negative, but I think we've also, um, because of being creative and using social and digital in particular for us, there've been some real pluses in it too. So I think our sport, we got, every, we got bright people, we got great owners, and I think everybody's looking at it, trying to say what's best for our sport going forward. I think we'll learn a lot, certainly from this year, because it's been, um, it really COVID tore up everything. Thank you, gentlemen, and congratulations, and thank you for giving us a wonderful season. And uh, I will reiterate that. Thank you, uh, Roger, Joe. Um, I appreciate your time, and the media does too, I'm sure. Best of luck on Sunday. Um, you guys are free to, free to go, or if you want to listen to Rick talk about Jimmy and Chad, you, you can stick around too. Um, so thank you again, uh, Roger and Joe, and good luck on Sunday. All right, guys, thanks. Thank you there. Hey, I just want to say uh, from Jimmy and Rick, you guys, that guy and the way you handled your programs there, that thing was top flight, first, first class. Uh, I think probably me and Roger were tired of sitting out in the audience watching you guys right. at that hand table all the time. But uh, I want to say big thanks to you and what, what you guys did. That, that, the hardest thing for me in pro sports is to stay up there. I'm, you know, in the two I've been in, and you guys stayed up there forever, it seemed like. So congrats on all that. I agree, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy's a Jimmy's one of a kind guy. Okay. Um, well, with that uh, comment, actually, uh, if you have a question for Rick on um, on Jimmy or Chad uh, and their respective seasons and careers, uh, feel free to start queuing up right now. Uh, and Rick, maybe if you want to just open up uh, how you're feeling going into the weekend, knowing that uh, these two legends are going to be. Um, sort of leaving the racetrack uh, from a competitive standpoint? Well, uh, you know, I talked to Jimmy probably two hours before this, for this call. And uh, we were kind of reminiscing old times and can't believe it's been 20 years. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's going to be, going to be uh, weird for me not to see Jimmy on the track and uh, with a 48 and Chad, it's going to take a new role as competition director. Uh, it's going. It's 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 just. Uh, it's going to be a real void not to see Jimmy. Uh, but it was with Jeff Gordon, you know, and it was with Dale, and uh, you know, I, I should be the one re retiring, not the drivers. But uh, you know, it's uh, it, it does leave a hole. But uh, you know, <clears throat> Jimmy's part of family, so. Uh, We'll still have our time off the track, but it's definitely going to be different. Okay, thank you, Rick. And we'll open up with questions. And uh, we'll start with Jenna Fryer. Go ahead, Jenna. Hey, Rick. Okay. I, I appreciate your ability to tell a good story. So I was hopeful that you could tell us a story about Jimmy Johnson and maybe about um, why Jimmy is so special and, and what you see in him or, or an incident or something that really stood out to you. Well, I... <clears throat> I, uh, I think Jimmy, I just have to reflect back to the guy that got on the airplane with me with a T-shirt on and, you know, I waited for at the end of a race to bring him home and then he becomes a champion, then he gets married, then he has kids. And, uh, but I think the thing about Jimmy through all that, he's the same Jimmy Johnson, you know, never, never a crossword with him never asked him to do anything that he didn't do. And uh, he, he, he's just uh, a guy, never, never hear him say anything about anybody else. You know, he's, he's as close to perfect as, as you can get to be a competitor that can do what he can do on the racetrack. 
you know, you just, uh, uh, just a super individual. Is it odd that someone with his success has not had, has not become pretentious at all? Nothing about him has changed him and made him a bad person or a, a selfish person? You know, you know, I think, I think that's super special because most everybody that gains fame and has the success he has, you know, with all the accolades he's had, that he uh, still uh, is humble and uh, maintains uh, such a, uh, I don't know, a professional attitude. Like when he missed the, missed the chase this year, this is his last year. He didn't get to celebrate with the fans. He hadn't bitched about it. Uh, he had, I know he's disappointed, but he's inspired the team. He's had terrible luck this year. And uh, you'd want to see a guy like that go out on top. But he, you know, when I was talking to him about it, he said, you know, I have to look at all this success that I've had. Yeah, I would like to have the fans there, my family there. Uh, you know, it's not the way I wanted to end it. But, but he's kept a positive attitude. And uh, you never see him say anything out of the way. And he just, uh, uh, everybody loves him, the sponsors, uh, the folks in the organization. And I think he, when he was kicking everybody's butt, there was a lot of animosity toward him. But when he wasn't winning every race, everybody seemed to warm up to him more. But, uh, but it wasn't because he was a, he was a different per. I mean, a, you know, a, a obnoxious person. He, I think he took it all the success and really in stride and, and just kept his head. And, uh, it, you know, he's, he's just a model. If you had a, uh, a young child or kid, you said, here's a champion, you know, watch him and how he handled himself. I think he's been a great role model for a lot of people. And lastly, I'm curious if, if there's an answer to the debate. Um, is it the car? Is it the crew chief? Is it the driver? Is it the car? Is there an answer to that? Well, I think uh, <laughs> you have to have them all. You can't, you can't have, you, you got to have the car for the guy. You got to have a driver. Uh, you got to have somebody can call the race and uh, you have to have them all. I don't, uh, he's had, moments when he was looked like Jimmy of old and I don't think we gave him the equipment to be honest with you that uh, he needed and uh, here toward the end we we weren't there the proof is we haven't been we have we weren't in the playoff the last few years but now we are getting our stuff together but it's uh, you know we've had a lot of change with him separating he and Chad which they wanted to do uh, you know, that's, that was different for him to, to get adjusted. And, you know, I, I don't think, I don't, Jimmy's better than what we've given him. I think for sure. Thank you. Next we'll go to Jordan Bianchi. Go ahead, Jordan. Rick, can you talk about Chad's decision to step off the pit box and go into a management role, what he brings to that role? Well, you know, Chad's got um, – it's worth having. It's unbelievable. And uh, to have him uh, come off of the box and really be responsible for four cars and keep the, uh, the energy level uh, where it needs to be, uh, I think it's going to be really good for our organization. I think he was ready for a change. I know he was. And uh, he, wa he wanted the challenge. Uh, and I think uh, he's going to make a big difference. Uh, we've got a senior guy like Allen uh, that's done a phenomenal job. And Jeff Andrews really uh, was just taking on so much as the competition director. Now the general manager and Chad, the two of them together, I think will make our organization better. But Chad's attention to detail uh, and getting all the – he and Allen work super close. And all of Greg was on, on Chad's team uh, as a lead engineer. Uh, so when you, when, you, when you think about all that, I think that the chemistry there and the talent Chad has 
for everything being uh, the best it can be, I think it's going to make a difference for us. I think he's a, he's accepting the challenge. Uh, he's a little nervous at first, uh, but because uh, now all of a sudden he's a guy that makes some of the decisions or a lot of decisions. But uh, I really think it's going to be good for him to have a new challenge in life. And I know how, how uh, detailed he is and how he wants things to be right. I think uh, uh, Jeff Andrews being moving, moving up and handling some of the stuff with NASCAR and all the other things that he had on his plate. I think it's, I'm, I'm excited about next year. I'm excited about that move. Next, we'll go to Dustin Long. Go ahead, Dustin. Thank you. Um, Rick, uh, Jimmy's time certainly expands, uh, stretches over a long period of time there at Hendrick Motorsports, and it goes back to a period uh, with being with your son and Ricky and the relationship that he had, and certainly uh, how Jimmy honored uh, Ricky in his pursuit of the seventh championship. And I'm curious, um, you know, what kind of special memories are there that, that has been that have been brought up about with Jimmy and Ricky as, as you reach this point? And is there a concern that as this chapter closes, there's a little bit of that chapter of your son closing? Because, I mean, obviously you still have the relationship with Jimmy, but he'll be off doing different things. And it's just right. somebody else from that era that won't be around as much. Well, you know, uh, yeah, it, Jimmy, again, where Jimmy and I were talking about that. Every time we get together, he starts telling me stories about Ricky I never, I never heard before. So actually this morning I said, hey, I want to get together with you and I just want us to sit around and, and tell stories because it actually makes, it, it brings back a lot of great memories for me. And, uh, you know, I, you know I, I think Ricky, um, we, we've done scholarships in his name. Uh, uh, we've 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 got a lot of, of of things to try to keep his memory alive but jimmy was a uh, they were uh, jimmy was special with him and uh ricky was the one that told me uh you need to hire this guy he's going to be a superstar and then uh then jeff raced against him but uh yeah it's um uh, you know dustin it, 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 you know time moves on and uh you know, you, you just have to hang on to those little nuggets that, uh, that, you know, you see, I'm, I'm, I've been running Ricky's paint scheme, uh, again, and, uh, everybody enjoys that part of, part of bringing the, the five back next year is, uh, part of history. And, uh, so, you know, it's, 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 I, I can always remember that, that, I paid attention to him when he told me you need to really look at this guy because he's going to be a, a superstar. And I, and I had to wait for him. Uh, <laughs> that's the one I'll never forget. Ricky's racing. Okay. Can Jimmy Johnson go home with us? Yes, yeah, sure. Five or 10 laps into the race, his alternator goes out in St. Louis and he parks the car and I'm ready to go home. Well, we got to wait for Jimmy. And so three and a half hours later, I'm sitting on the plane and I got him some cheeseburgers. So he <laughs> has some food, but, uh, and Jimmy and I laugh about that story, but, uh, no, it, it's, uh, a lot of great memories. And you mentioned, you said what Jimmy brought up a story today when you were talking to him that you hadn't heard about, about Ricky. Can, can you share that one? I don't think so. <laughs> no. All right. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Okay, we'll go to Nate Ryan. Go ahead, Nate. Yeah, speaking of all those memories, Rick, um, when you think back about Jimmy and Chad, obviously all of their greatest successes are kind of inextricably linked to you and the infamous or maybe famous milk and cookies meeting you had after the 05 season. Um, do you ever reflect back on that and think, like, would they have had the same degree of success? Would they have had the same run if you hadn't brought them in and, and done that? And I guess, you know, what are your memories of that? You know, it was, it was a situation where we were raised, we were so close to making a change because uh, they were fighting like cats and dogs. And, uh, but I looked at it and said, you know, this, uh, 
it, it just it's that's so good uh, how can we get over this hump because if you separate them you don't know if you'll ever have the success that they would have had together because i could see that and uh, so the idea to uh and, and they were so uptight but when it came in and uh we started talking and i said and i had the gallon of milk and the cookies and i said you know let's uh we're gonna have some cookies and milk and then we'll sit on the floor and have uh you know a little bit of peace time here and they started laughing and and and, and when they started laughing i said look you know how close you guys are to fixing this you just uh you know you, you don't know what the what is around the corner but you can you can fix this if, if you work together and i think you're going to be great and so uh they they started they laughed and we let there hey tell me what you don't like about him you tell me what you don't like chad what you don't, what's what's rubbing you raw with jimmy jimmy what's rubbing you and then when they when they started talking said is that really a problem I mean, is that something that we're going to have a divorce over? So I felt like a marriage counselor there, but it, it worked out. Have you ever wondered how much success they could have had apart? Like if you hadn't been able to mend that fence, would, do you think they still win races apart? Do they still win championships apart from each other? I, I think I think they probably would, but I don't think they would have. I don't think either one on their own at that point would have been as good as they were together because Jimmy, Chad was kind of a leader and he pushed Jimmy and Jimmy needed a little bit of that. But then Jimmy started coming to his own and he didn't want that. But uh, I think the combination when they got, when they started was so good that, uh, and then they just started uh, clicking. So I'm, I'm very glad, I'm super glad that, that we were able to keep them together because the proof is in what they did. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. And okay, we'll go next to uh, Davey Siegel. Go ahead, Davey. Yeah, Rick. A lot of people mention how Jimmy's run and his talent overall behind the wheel is a bit underappreciated. Why do you feel that way? Or why do you think that is, excuse me, that he's underappreciated? Or if you personally don't feel that way, why do you think a lot of other people within the industry or the sport may feel that way? Well, I think... Uh... I think Jimmy did it without a lot of fanfare and, uh, you know, he could have been cocky and he could have been, uh, you know, challenging other drivers, uh, in the media or whatever. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't that way. And I think that, um, uh, the success he had got to be almost so routine that, uh, people just didn't appreciate you know, the talent that he had and that they thought, well, it's a car, you know, well, it was Chad, you know, uh, but uh, it took, it took the guy to wheel the car and the combination of the two of them were really good. But uh, I mean, probably the, the best combination in the, the sports ever seen. Uh, but I think Jimmy has been appreciated more after he won the five in a row. Uh, and then winning in 16. But, um, you know, I, I, I think it, I think that's been true with, with Gordon and Earnhardt and, uh, a lot of the drivers have been champions. I think, you know, after the fact, they seem to be appreciated more and you look at the talent that they had. And as a quick follow-up, the infamous golf cart incident in 2006, I know it was 14 years ago, so maybe the statute of limitations has passed, maybe it hasn't, but can you take us back there and what your thoughts were about that entire situation at the time? Well, I, I, uh, I took him to the hospital that night. I met him when he got back, and, uh, and you know, the first, the first report we got was he was riding in the golf cart, and then... Uh, I think things changed and he was riding on top of the golf cart. And, uh, so, uh, you know, <laughs> it feels like that was, uh, yesterday, not that many years ago, but, uh, no, it, it was, uh, one of those things that you think, what, what were you doing? What were you thinking? 
uh, you know, and and but I, I think it made more of a splash because it the story came out that he fell out of the golf cart, then he was on top of the golf cart and he was enjoying himself. So uh, everybody's entitled to have a, have a little fun. Yes, he was. Thank you, Mr. H. Next, we'll go to Greg Engel. Go ahead, Greg. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, <clears throat> Mr. H, um, Jimmy, looking looking for the future, obviously he's going to be driving an IndyCar and gosh knows what, what else. And obviously you'll have a place for him there in the organization if he decides he ever wants to do that. Uh, is he going to be around helping to mentor your young drivers? And if he decides to, to finally hang up his racing gloves, so to speak, um, do you see a, a, a part, a, a role for him there at the team in some sort of executive position? Is that something you guys have talked about? You know, I think <clears throat> Jimmy has, uh, he wants a break and he doesn't want to race every weekend. He wants to spend time with his family. They do a lot of things together and, uh, and he wants to do, he wants other challenges. So I think you'll see him not just in, IndyCar, I think you'll see him in sports cars. He'll be in the 24 hours of Daytona, and and uh, he'll be doing a lot of a lot of uh, driving in other series. I think he's he's he just needs a break. I think, and uh, and and he and he's got this this excitement when he drove that F1 car. I, I he was as as excited as he was when he won a championship, he was really pumped up about that. And so he's, uh, he's, he's, he's a guy that likes challenges, whether it's snow skiing or uh, anything he does, he, uh, he wants to do it to the max, but he priority one for him now, I think, and what he's told me is he wants to spend time with his family and he wants to look at other venues that, you know, that are on his bucket list and he's a heck of a talent. So I think he'll do well in anything he decides to do. But, but if, he's, if he wants to come back and help me, I'm, I'm ready. Thank you so much, Mr. H. Next we'll go to Michael Knight. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. H, when uh, Jeff was uh, doing his last few races, I asked you if it was all right for people to feel emotional about it. And you said, yes, that, you know, there is emotion in racing, that you felt the emotion of it. And obviously, uh, as you've explained over the years, Jeff took uh, Hendrick Motorsports to a certain level, became like a son to you. It was special to have Dale Jr. in the team. And now, you know, with Jimmy leaving, are the emotions, your personal emotions, uh, thinking about Jeff ending and then Dale Jr. and now Jimmy, are those emotions kind of the same or are they kind of different and individual to each one of those drivers? Thank you. You know, uh, you have, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, great relationship with all of them, but basically emotions are emotions. Uh, and I've got, I get super close to all of my guys and, and uh, they're all like family to me. And when the realization that this is the last race, whether it's Terry Labonte, uh, Jeff Gordon, uh, it meant so much uh, to me. Dale, you, you know, he, he filled a void. Uh, you know, Jimmy, uh, I've, I've seen him, uh, I won't say I've raised him, but uh, I mean, uh, but he's been with me his entire career and I've, I've watched him as a rookie come up to be a champion. So, you know, the good news is I try to tell myself, I'm gonna have a relationship with these guys. It's not gonna end. That's what Jimmy and I were talking about today. We're, we're still family and we're gonna do things together, but it's, you know, but the, the emotional side of seeing this history come to an end with uh, all of these guys. It's been, it's, it's been real emotional and it's different. You're right. Uh, each one is a little, little different. Uh, got to, uh, 
you know, but they're all, uh, but I get, I come back to, to the same thing. Our raw emotions uh, are emotions and you get, they get choked up, get choked up uh, because it's the end of something special. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your time. That will wrap up our availability with our owners and a special one here with uh, Rick Hendrick on the careers of Jimmy Johnson and Chad Knauss. Thanks so much for the extra time, uh, Mr. H, and uh, good luck on Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hendrick. Yeah, thank you, guys. All right. Our next availability will be at 3 p.m. with the uh, manufacturers. All three will be uh, available on Zoom. Uh, again, you can grab that link on NASCARmedia.com. Uh, and then we'll, uh, after that, we'll have our Gander Truck Championship and the post-race availability after that. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you Thank soon. Thank you.